So earlier this year, the AECE, um, the American, uh, hold on, the Association for the Advancement of Cost Engineering had its conference here in Toronto, annual general meeting. Um, I was able to be there and I was very busy on the booth floor, but, floor, but I did get to one talk and this was the talk. It was called Evaluating CPM Schedules for Best Practices. And it was put on by these gentlemen, um, J. Gerard Boyle, Andrew Podolny, and Dr. Whale Manessi. And um, I have <clears throat> a great respect for these guys. I think they all work for a company called Reve, which is a sort of a claims type um, association uh, around North America. But it was a great talk, and I learned a few things. And I've been in to P6 for a long, long time, but I learned a few things and I've been meaning to share this with you. So I'm basically gonna rehash their talk and uh, even use their slides and whatnot. All right, so evaluating CPM for best practices. Here's sort of the, um, the agenda, okay? So in search of scheduled best practices, attempts at best practices, and what they're presenting is the need for a two-step approach. So let's gloss over this and get into it. Now, they quote a great article, okay? And, and I've included that article in the downloads. And it's an article from 2003 called Critics Can't Find the Logic in Many of CPM's Today's CPM Schedules. It's an article that's been quoted quite a lot in Project Controls, and it's written by O'Brien and uh, some of his colleagues. Now, I don't know if you guys know, but uh, James O'Brien and Fred Plotnick are uh, authors of this story, as a few other guys. But James O'Brien and Fred Plotnick have been in Project Controls for years. They have a they have a book, and that book has sort of been considered one of the most widely accepted books in Project Controls. So uh, Fred Plotnick also runs the CPM Construction CPM Scheduling Conference. So here's the problem: CPM schedules aren't actually CPM schedules. What's going on? Well, widespread abuses of powerful software are producing badly flaws or deceptive schedules. Now, we've touched on some of these topics before in our talks, um, but here we're going to go deep on these. Um, a lot of the schedules in construction are put together as a tool for claims. Um, now, I think things have changed over, over the years. But again, this talk is just a talk from this June, this June. So these are their beliefs, okay? So we need a return to the fundamental principles in CPM. All right, so let's get into it. What's the problem? What's the effect? 30% of waste in the construction industry. This is a widely quoted stat from The Economist in 2000. Um, construction industry is decreasing in productivity since 1964, while other industries have increased by 200%. Perhaps, yep. Construction disputes are taking longer to resolve worldwide. There's definitely a trend towards more disputes, more, more companies interested in learning about how to protect themselves from claims, because there are more claims. So, question, is this sustainable? Let's get deeper. Why are schedules failing? Okay, so there has been a lack of clear and accepted industry best practices for CPM scheduling. We're, the industry is working hard on that. And there's a bit of history here. Uh, PMI used to have a college of scheduling. And some of these guys that wrote these articles were part of that college of scheduling, but the college of scheduling disbanded um, and sort of rebanded, but it's not quite what it was. The, uh, recently we have uh, the launch of something called the Guild of Project Controls, which is coming out of uh, England. And these guys are trying hard to bring back the College of Scheduling in, their, in, an, in a smarter way, where we can sort of, uh, where they're trying hard to establish uh, proper standards for project controls, where CPM scheduling is a big part of it. Okay. So lack of accepted industry best practices because we don't really have a governing um, body that's overseeing it in a, in a strong, strong way. Lack of understanding of the enormous potential of meaningful schedules. If you listen to the talk um, 
Gerard talks a lot about having a great CPM schedule that is cost and resource loaded. That's sort of the gold standard for him. And we don't, he's saying that we don't understand how hugely potential, like the huge potential that, of that tool. If we had more of those, we would save ourselves a lot of heartache. Okay, lack of commitment to scheduling program, lack of expertise, insufficient resources, and this is what this is why I'm presenting this because I found it so interesting. Scheduling software problems. Not only do we have a problem with all of this confusion of you know no set best practices and whatnot, but we also have scheduling software that is confusing and at times not behaving properly. And I'm, we're going to dive into that. Okay. Um, so there are, there have been attempts at best practices. We have things like the GAO, okay, Government Accountability Office has produced a schedule assessment guide. The DCMA 14-point schedule metrics we've talked about in the past, but it's another document um, from the Defense Contract Management Agency, which outlines 14 points for a good schedule. And then NASA's got their own thing there, so you can check all those out. Um, but what we're saying here is that um, even before we look at a schedule for whether it's adhered to best practices, we should determine whether that schedule actually is a CPM schedule by definition. That's, this is what these guys are saying. We need to go back to the definition of CPM scheduling. Okay, So let's go back to the definition. So essentially one, is it a CPM schedule by definition? And two, then let's evaluate the schedule for best practices. And if we, if we, if it doesn't clear one, then we're saving ourselves a lot of work. We're not going to bother evaluating the schedule for best practices if it's not even a CPM schedule. It doesn't even uh, fit the bill. Okay. So um, here is the definition of a CPM schedule from um, PMI a method used to estimate the minimum project duration and determine the amount of schedule flexibility on the logical network paths within the schedule model. Okay, so that, if you go to PMI, PMBOK, that's what you'll find. Um, so it should also identify driving paths, determining the completion of the project. The determination of flexibility, you know, we talk about total float, that's sort of what that's hinting at. Okay, the determinant of flexibility of the entire network requires that all activities be logically connected. All float values must be reliable. Okay, so we need a network. It has to be completely connected. If it's not completely connected, what they're saying is it's not a CPM schedule. Okay, all the float values must be reliable. And what we'll see is that there's some things that affect the float some tools, some scheduling, um, you know, some features of the software even that will affect the total float, uh, make, writing them unreliable. Okay, so Avi's saying, is it to say minimum project duration? Yeah, we want to finish the project as quick as possible, so that's why they say minimum project duration. That's also why we say it's the longest path through the project because it's the it's the path that is the longest, but also leads to the shortest project duration. So, yes. Okay, so that's the definition. CPM, the critical path then of a CPM schedule is a sequence of activities that represents the longest path through the project, which determines the shortest duration, just what I said before. So scheduling software, if used properly, should generate a critical path or multiple critical paths that determine determine the shortest duration. So here's a quick and dirty little um, Gantt we've got here. So we're going to go through a couple of these to see what's what's going on. Okay, so this schedule analysis technique calculates early, early start, early and late dates for all activities without any resource limitations. So again, this is still part of the definition of CPM scheduling and that the entire network must be calculated. And more importantly, we can't use resource leveling. So resource leveling um, is the process of, you know, 
looking at how your resourcing is across the schedule and then altering activity times based on total float where there's available float, altering those so that you don't have too many resources doing too much work at the same time. So if you have you know one or two crews um, that are, let's say, doing paving, and as you build your schedule, you notice that, oh, you've got you know a lot of paving all happening at the same time, but you have more than the two crews can handle, then you would sort of space that out based on total float. So that's resource leveling. And some of you probably know that within P6, we have an automated leveling tool. You can tell P6 to do resource leveling for you. Um, it's not advised, and it basically comes back to that point in the CPM schedule that all float values must be reliable. And when we use resource leveling, we are shifting activities around where there's available float. So those of those, um, it's not the most efficient schedule anymore if we've resource leveled it. So we can't use a resource level schedule. So mandatory criteria based on the schedule. Everything must be linked. Must be logic driven, meaning that uh, this comes from the first point. If it's linked properly, it will be logic driven. But we can't be putting constraints in there in our schedule um, because constraints affect where, um, a, a constraints take away the logic driven quality of a schedule. They make it date driven, okay? It's continuous logic driven critical paths that determine the shortest duration. Appropriate logical relationships, so you're using finish to start, Mostly, you're not doing everything uh, with start to starts and finish to finishes. Not allowed to have activities with fractional durations. What's a fractional duration? Well, we did an Ask a Plan Academy video about this not that long ago, where a fractional duration is you know, 0.8 of a day. Primavera lets you do that, 0.8 or 0.25 of a day. Um, that can mess up your schedule majorly, so we don't want that. No alteration of the software filters, you know, the critical path filter is the critical path filter, and the appropriate selection of the critical path filter in P6. So these are what we need to have in place in order to be considered a CPM schedule. All right, so let's keep going. CPM software uses different algorithms for CPM. This is where it gets interesting to me. It would be expected that so long that so long as the poor practices criticized by O'Brien in their article are avoided, the critical paths generated by the software would readily and reliably, reliably identify the critical path. But that's not the case. We have situations where both Oracle P6 and Microsoft Project use different algorithms and may produce different results. Okay, so we have inconsistencies in the software. And then, as we're going to see in a few minutes, as we dive deeper into P6, um, features of P6 will also report, uh, as they're saying, sort of uh, change, the, change the schedule uh, such that you have messed it up a little bit and have different reports of criticality. Okay? Problems with the software, use of the software features like calendars and constraints make and create very different reports of criticality. So, all right, so here's where we're going to look at some of these P6 problems. <laughs>